Welcome back to the RLR podcast. Again, uh, if you guys did not catch last week, we did change up kind of our schedule and the uh, the way we're presenting this video wise on YouTube uh, for 2021. Uh, my name is Nick. Uh, sitting virtually across from me is Matt. <laughs> And, uh, (laughs) boy, do we have another episode for you guys this week. Uh, so I think... uh, A lot of this, uh, virtual Cinecross gonna be like that way for a while, obviously. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, (laughs) with that. Yeah, I think we, uh, we should jump right into some of our, uh, quick hit topics and recharge. Recharge over the last week, well, uh, I think Chief and a lot of stuff is some pretty interesting or some cool stuff, but... I mean, we've talked about it before. I, I know that re- listeners have heard that he's myself and uh, been a big Corvette fan when I was a kid. Still am, but not as much as I was, you know, kind of thing. But there is a pretty big deal anniversary for the Corvette today as it the Corvette nameplate, the, what we currently know as today, current generation being the C8 mid-engine, it turns 68 years old today. So on this day in 19... Is it... I have to do math now for this. Hang on. In 19, <laughs> oh, duh, 50, there we go, 53. Make sure I got that right. The uh, the 53, and then you know later, more uh, production run 54 was debuted. Uh, I believe at, it says here, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City, which, Very I mean, famous hotel. How, how official is that back in the day, frankly? But, uh, I mean, yeah, America's often called America's sports car. It's a pretty big birthday, so it turned the Corvette in and of itself, turns 68 today. Uh, so I, I think it's pretty cool. So happy birthday. Don't screw it up, Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> leave it alone and leave it the way it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, you want to touch on, on that little piece of news as to why you're saying leave it alone? Or uh... Oh, well, a- apparently uh, what? Like how because yeah, of European markets stuff like that they're i think i remember reading that they're looking into like turning it into like a hybrid and doing all this kind of stuff to it i could have sworn i even saw something that you know people saying that they, you know chevy should make a corvette what uh uh not coop what's the term um they, suv yeah. to compete with like like the they, Macan, they, like they're looking the to make an electric crossover with the corvette nameplate I mean, like what ford did with the mustang naked. which everybody no. who knows anything about cars got extremely upset about so i, I could see frankly like i could see a, a like like an suv like a sports s like a sports suv to maybe compete with the uh, porsche Macan or cayenne i could i could see that i don't think i'd be happy about it but you know, I could see it technically. Don't, don't give it but, but the nameplate. That's don't it. If they, if they want to give ruin it, it, the nameplate. Use the Camaro. The Camaro sell, selling like crap. You know, it just use the ruin the Camaro. Leave the Corvette alone. <laughs> that's, that's my hot take on that. Just go ruin the Camaro. Turn that into some hideous electric crossover or, thing. Or and do fine. I don't care. Or go back and. Well, you can't even go back. I would say almost make it the Blazer EV. You mm, use no. use an existing you know SUV now crossover that. nameplate, but the I don't better, understand people idea. using muscle car. Hey, you know. and I said when we saw the Mach E first outright, right? Like it would be a decent electric. Like it is, frankly, a decent electric car by all like you know the uh, preliminary reports. For all intents and right? purposes, it's a it it's a good electric SUV. Fine, if it was a its own nameplate if they just so called it a mach e just drop the mustang name so off of it maybe don't, don't even ruin the camaro i don't care if you keep selling it because apparently it's selling very horribly frankly even during pandemic times or not but what if you do don't touch the corvette leave it alone <laughs> i don't even i don't even necessarily and i know you're you are you have more corvette blood in you than i do um mm-hmm. I don't have even have necessarily a problem with it going hybrid electric, you know, like for performance. Yeah, Ooh. as is though, like 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 don't. Yeah, yeah. I, I would as agree. as like, the C8 sits right now, that is the way. Of, like the P1, like the hypercar, like you know what the the LaFerrari, the P1, the Porsche 918. 
they proved the performance that can be achieved there. And that's not what I'm saying. I would agree. Like if it goes that way in like, like a zero one mile, or I'm hearing rumors of like a Zora model of it, you know, of the, sure, the yeah. engine. I, I get that. But beyond that, don't touch it. Yeah. No, I, 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 that still, agree. that still retains the Corvette aura, you know, don't touch it. <laughs> yeah. It's been going 68 years already today. It's gone through good times and bad times, well documented throughout history and, and sales, and it's still going. It's America's sports car, small changes. You know, you just made a giant one. Don't you go making a fucking like Mach-E kind of thing, or pitchforks are coming out. <laughs> We're going to march down the street and go to the Chevy headquarters. Or yeah. even, or what, even GM headquarters. Oh, okay, anyway. Uh, speaking so, of car yeah, companies. Well, well. <laughs> The one car company that is not considering making an electric SUV with a existing muscle car nameplate. Thank you, uh, Dodge. Yes, <laughs> Dodge. Uh, and this is kind of gonna, this is gonna be a jump. So I apologize. I do not have a good segue for this. Um, so about re- airlines. Yeah, about <laughs> airlines, and specifically how much it costs to uh, buy one of those baggage tugs. Um, mm-hmm. We saw a what? a small <laughs> airline out of Thunder Bay, I've Ontario. I've seen a better use for this <laughs> this uh, automobile. <laughs> uh, there's one rival, but I I'll explain in a minute. Okay. <laughs> uh, there, there's a small airline, budget airline, uh, short haul, whatever you want to call it, out of Thunder Bay, Ontario. That has not been purchasing baggage tugs for their planes but instead <laughs> they are modifying really just and can i clarify real quick what i used to when you say modify what they're doing yeah yeah so <laughs> so they're chopping off the top <laughs> oh they're, they're more than chopping off the top let's they're get to the point off a salt, they're taking a salt off to the roof of the car <laughs> Let, let's get to the point here they're using dodge neons but they're not really Dodge Neons. It's the front end of a Dodge Neon. It's the powertrain of a Dodge Neon and a big old metal box with a metal bench and a uh, kind of seatbelt uh, that then can carry the <laughs> baggage no back and forth. So think of uh, the small... One thing that strikes me as small was small, small regional Canadian airline, right? Essentially? Right, yeah. I mean, it's Canada. Doesn't it get a little cold? <laughs> Yeah, but the baggage carts are out in the weather anyway. I know, but I wouldn't want to be driving around a Dodge Neon, a convertible Dodge Neon <laughs> in Canadian winter, frankly. I don't Would you? No, but I also don't think anybody who's working out doing baggage carts and things like that necessarily has a choice. You're always going to be out in the elements. <laughs> you might be if right. if you're going to do that, I would rather be able to do donuts in a front-wheel drive Dodge Neon with literally no weight over the rear wheels because you can't really do donuts in a front-wheel drive car. That's a kind of a misnomer. But anyway, <laughs> I would rather go have fun in what is essentially a Dodge Neon with two-thirds of the weight gone. Uh, Give them props for their, uh, what would you call it, stick to their, uh, their in- ingenuity? Yeah, I would, I would call it... Um, uh, ingenuity in the same lines as the uh, Canadian tuxedo denim jacket with denim uh, pants. Hey, that uh, you know, he is a mother of all invention, and if it works, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, we <laughs> uh... just a lot. It's it, you see, you gotta go, you guys have to go look this up online. It, it's it's kind of hilarious, especially the ones that literally look like the front of a Dodge Neon with no roof and a metal box in the back. I mean, it's just, well, it's I, I mean, essentially that's what it is. It's the front end of a Dodge Neon with a metal well, box I've, in the I've back. seen some of them. I remember seeing actually a couple of places that put like a, like different articles talked about it. And some of them looked like they had metal boxes and other ones just looked like they cut the roof and doors off and the trunk lid. And that's what they used. You know, I, I, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's two different models, you know, there's two different models of these things. Who knows? Maybe a new uh, maybe maybe they can turn it into a side business. You know, don't want to pay sixty what sixty grand for that uh, that that tug. Well, have you seen the new the Dodge Neon convertible? Well, and the the thing that I can't get past with this one pe- excuse me specific story. It just looks hilarious. Well, one, it looks hilarious, but two, they've been using these since the Neon was in production. 
Why? <laughs> I did not know that, but that's that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, what, most suppose... people see a, a, a consumer car come out and say, huh, yeah, I'd like to have that. Or maybe uh, maybe we'll get that for Jenny for her, her 16th birthday. And they see, guys, I found our new baggage carriers. <laughs> guys, <laughs> okay. Hear Went to out. the Dodge dealership. Bought my daughter this car. She didn't like it. I think we found our new baggage carrier. And everybody's looking at him like, what? Stay on with earth? me. Can you see, like, in the meeting, like, you know, like ground floor, guys, come outside with me. Picks up a sawzall on the way out and just chops off the roof. Says, what do you think? <laughs> I just, the th- yeah. So every article that I'm looking yeah. at says that they appeared sometime around 2002. The neon was still in production when that happened. Hey man, I mean, I can't, I can't knock them too much. Like it's hilarious. I think it's awesome though. Like, well, and and the best thing was show. reading that the the airline when they had their photo shoot for their press photography oh, had to borrow did. someone else's tug because they were too embarrassed of their neons. Hey, it's for the gram. <laughs> hey, yeah, the clout. <laughs> oh man, it it's pretty cool. Uh, I I hope I hope that they don't get rid of their trusty neons anytime soon. Frankly, it's a, it's a good point of a good point of fun in in today's world. So. Yeah, they, it's pretty cool. It uh, the drive article says, "Why spend thirty thousand dollars on a tug when a cheap '90s neon will do the job for the cost of a sawzall and maybe a couple blades?" <laughs> so, well, good on them. Was that Bearskin Airlines? Bearskin <laughs> Airlines, yeah, out of Thunder Bay, Ontario. So, if you're trying to look it up to to get a good look at these, they're quite hilarious. Wow, well, um, maybe moving on and a little bit. Of, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe those are some successes in auto. But how about some fails in the automotive world with uh, in the form of BMW and Maserati as we shift over here into the new year kind of thing with a little good, bit of their marketing. Good segue. Why don't we start with the Maserati shift? Um, so uh, apparently Maserati doesn't know how to upshift. <laughs> I, I just, um, I, I think whatever marketing firm they hired did not have a good understanding of cars when they decided to put something for together. For those who haven't seen the video, I'll let uh, Nick, I'll let you the other manufacturers here but more of the story is maserati released a video for the new year saying well you know let's essentially get hyped up you know it's new year and let's just shift up up not down and then you watch the video and eagle eye viewers of the video pointed out very quickly that instead of upshifting in their video talking about upshifting they're de- they downshift <laughs> they downshift so yeah, yeah, pretty aggressively too they don't, they, they don't even know like they don't even know which way to shift. <laughs> I, I, but, it's hilarious. Like, but an even, I, I can't do the video justice. You have to go watch it, frankly. It's hilarious. But the bigger blunder is BMW's oh. marketing or their marketing firm oh boy, you're taking taking a video of the M2 competition. And Arguably one of their best cars. For, at, like, at, like, looks great, sounds great already. Dry, like amazing driving experience, right? Like it's all over the, the internet. Yeah, right? well, right? well, in in a lot of you know reviewers and a lot of people who have you know who drive press cars for a living, the M2 competition is the best BMW in most cases. Get it in a uh, manual, and you will have all. The, I mean, it, it makes me, I wish someday to drive an M2 comp, like a current gen M, at least M2 competition and manual, the manual, because it just seems like the, some of the most fun you can have behind. It's the, the definition wheel. of a driver's car. Uh, exactly. And, you know, so arguably, I would say they don't really, they shouldn't have to do much, especially to petrol heads and even to, you know, non petrol mm. heads. They should just be able to, you know, quickly explain and be good to go. But the but, marketing, but marketing oh, decided. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, whatever marketing firm or whatever video firm put the video together, and then for whatever reason, in both of these cases, the department reviewed it and let it go. Uh, BMW decided to put a Lamborghini V10 motor sound over the M2 <laughs> competition. Please, and someone you know on Earth, sounds- explain to me why this was okay and how did this pass? anybody at bmw to get out on the internet i mean the sound that they dubbed over even like even it's not even a bmw brand v10 it's a lamborghini which is an audi brand 
it, which it's is a Volkswagen. Like dude, is what it is. Like the Maserati one is just comical, right? But this one's hilarious. This mess up is just hilarious. How because do you, you watch get... the video, I like you and I both know what that car sounds like with how much like you know of a driver. Like we know it's a driver's car, right? Obviously, and we we followed it, and you know, it's for me, it's it's a dream drive. It's I'll call it one day. But to that point, like I know, like we know what it sounds like, and when you watch the video, it's hilarious how unlike that car <laughs> the the sounds that are coming from this video are it's oh man it's, it's it terrible. it literally sounds like someone took video out of Forza Horizon where they've it just really swapped does. in the Lamborghini V10 and tried to go around a corner in it and you're like that doesn't sound right it doesn't it really doesn't and the fact that BMW did it in a marketing video released it to the internet and just thought we would now. What? I really hope that I have I don't know. I don't know if if Maserati or BMW has have pulled these you know respective videos, but frankly, for both of them, I, I hope that they have. <laughs> Maserati mm-hmm. would be a little bit easier to get away with if you weren't paying attention to it. You're paying attention if you know anything about cars and you're paying attention to the BMW one. You're gonna realize, hey, wait a second, this tiny car does not have a V10 out of a yeah, Lamborghini. There's a in very it. big difference in sound between a Lamborghini, a V10 in general, and a Lamborghini. 10 and what a, a three liter twin turbo six cylinder i mean like yeah. there's there's a really big difference <laughs> right and you don't even have to know anything about cars to know that they sound different it, it's hilarious uh it, it really is so they're both worth a watch i don't know where you can watch them um i'm looking online here if if in fact the you know the companies have taken down those ads i'm looking on um i watch them personally n- no affiliation you know and uh sponsored at all i watched uh what was it i think it's uh jason camisa jason yeah it's j-a-s-o-n c-a-m-m-i-s-a on instagram that's where i watched them um so uh it, they're they're worth a watch <laughs> frankly if you can find them yeah cool. it, it yeah. yeah it's real well yeah, legitimate it, insanity so well, another, another another thing that didn't reach out over the last week, you pointed out to me, uh, but about uh, some potential, you know, obviously future updates for cars and, and aircraft, right? Yeah. So essentially, with the big boom in the like computer gaming industry, there there's a couple big players. One of them is Nvidia. Uh, there is some rumors out there right now, uh, which have kind of halfway been confirmed by Nvidia's CEO that yeah. they are going to start develop developing chipsets for the uh the displays in uh vehicle headrests Both aircraft and yeah. automobiles, right? Yeah, so that it would be the headrest video systems for cars, planes, and it, essentially any mode of transportation. He specifically said cars and planes. But... I frankly don't know much about, you know, this company. So I guess, you know, in layman's uh, I guess what, what does that mean? You know, you know. Kind of so, what does so essentially, that? what what a GPU or a graphic processing unit well, um, okay. it would do in this situation is allow people to, you know, bring a laptop along and plug something in, or yeah. you know, for the long haul 4k video watching Mm. person it would better be able to handle some of these situations not that the current chipsets out there would be a big deal though i mean if i would imagine if if current chipsets do that now like obviously there are current chipsets that frankly do that with you know like television and stuff like that right Or, or, or monitors and so on but i mean i'm just thinking here you know growing up into the future kind of thing I mean, right now, like, I I remember when 4K didn't exist, and then now you're buying 4K TVs. I mean, think, like, you know, in the U.S., your cable companies are even broadcasting in 4K yet, you know? It eventually will happen, right? And then you have 8K now, and who knows what else. So, I, I look at it, like, for me, it sounds like, kind of like, when I bought a, I'm a Mac person, and uh, when I bought a, when I went to college, I bought a, well, as you know, a MacBook Pro, a Retina MacBook Pro, mm-hmm. and I what I noticed is the screen was obviously so much more clear than what I was used to, you know, throughout entire life, frankly. And I can't go back. Like I won't buy a device that doesn't have at least a a full, like true high res screen, you know? And I think 
you know, if this brings this kind of stuff to aircraft and, you know, and automobiles, kids, especially in the future, that's all they're going to ever going to know. And let's be honest, when you look at an HD screen, actual HD, like a retina or a real, like a 4K, something that isn't like maybe the current video systems that are on a lot of air days, you notice the difference. So I think it might not, you know, make a lot of headlines for normal, you know, everyday people, but it sounds like, you know, that's the way the world's going. And what, you know, seems logical, another place to have 4K, 8K screens when your kids are playing Xbox games on long family road trips. <laughs> like well, the, the, and the it's, it's less, yeah, and I think it's less about the actual screen resolution and more about the capabilities of it. Yeah, so, of course. Um, and obviously we're not talking about NVIDIA, who I current generation is the, the 3000 series RTX uh, for PC gaming. Um, that's kind of where the current generation's at. Uh-huh. Uh, we're not talking about that kind of chipset oh. for for this. We're talking about a commercialized chipset, but something that's a little bit more robust than what's out there now, and to and have more it capable. more right. capable. But uh, on, on top of that, it can also be mass produced with higher quality. I mean, yeah. we're. we're you look at a, an airplane screen now, and you've got maybe a 480p in some cases. Maybe. Um, Unless it's like, like brand new, you know, a Dreamliner or whatever. Maybe. Yeah, and even so, it, you, to get Unless anywhere near a 4K screen. First, I mean. yeah. Well, to and to get anywhere near a 4K screen on any kind of jet nowadays, you're going to have to be looking at a privately owned Airbus or a Boeing business jet. So you're not, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it, but it sounds like it's it definitely sounds like I don't want to say small potatoes, but right now it seems like little small potatoes could be a huge, you know, in well into the future it could be a, a very huge deal. So I mean, yeah, it's cool, it's cool to see. Um, yeah. Next, um, next thing, another thing you told me about uh, before we logged on here with a pretty sounds like a pretty big merger in the automotive industry, right? Yeah. So last week, over the last week, um, FCA or Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. Uh, they're global Gigantic and organization, obviously. Yes, uh, and the mines at Peugeot have decided to create a merger. But interestingly, they called it Stellantis, which I think it sounds pretty cool. I think I I do think it sounds cool. I think it would be interesting to see an actual car with a Stellantis name badge. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's they really just that a name parent company. To like. You think I wonder if they made it in like you know like Peugeot in the states obviously isn't as well known as it might be in Europe, and Fiat Chrysler automobiles might not have the best name in the states or the rest of the world. So maybe it's about you know creating something technically new or legitimately rebranding. I don't know. I'm not saying that Fiat Chrysler you know automobiles makes crappy cars, but I've come across just a few in my short years here from. Uh, from them, and I, I've never seen actually. I never driven or, or you know, experienced with, with Peugeot vehicles, but it sounds like it could be an opportunity for both companies to have increased awareness or a little bit of rebrand. And I don't know, but it seems like a pretty big deal for given the size, at least of you know. I think I think it's more about and, shared assets, and at this point, um... I mean, but what's the you know, like? What are the size though? I mean, like I would imagine that Peugeot is large, but I would, gotta imagine like Fiat Chrysler's portfolio across the world is is per- larger. Peugeot's than pretty Peugeot's large, family. but I and I don't know who was essentially. I mean, I know it's a merger, but let's be honest. Mm-hmm. There's usually one larger company absorbing another and then creating the yeah. quote unquote merger. I don't know yep. who was the larger slash smaller company here. Fiat yeah, I... has the history in Europe, obviously. So does Peugeot. Mm-hmm. Peugeot, but Peugeot's not been as big as a Renault or mm-hmm. the Volkswagen Group. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking with like maybe you know Fiat Chrysler being a little large. Either way, I mean, sounds like obviously a new partnership, new parent company name, and who knows what's going to come out of this. Frankly, maybe it's you know maybe it's for just for business reasons, which happens from time to time. Like you know, you can you can compete better when you join forces versus uh, you know separately, but. And you know, given the current times with economic 
you know, crises all over the world and the pandemic and, you know, who knows, it could, it could just be a, a good time for them to kind of combine heads, you know, and take the fight to some larger uh, automobile. Yeah, and, and this was pretty recent, so I'm sure over the next week, and maybe we'll follow up oh, with this okay, next so. week, is that we'll figure out more and more about what's going on with this merger and what the, the ideas are behind it. So we'll we'll keep yeah. you uh, informed on that. Um, and uh, maybe the last thing in the, the spirit of keeping everybody... Well, and it kind of follows travel. along... Yeah, well, it kind of follows along. Like, Stellantis sounds kind of like a spaceship name. And uh, we're, we're fighting hard for the transitions here. Yeah, I know it's bad. We <laughs> I apologize keep it in this week, guys. Cool. <laughs> so keeping in line with something else cool is the last thing I saw over the past week is uh, NASA actually fired the first test fire of what is coined as the largest or what the mo- or the most powerful rocket in the world. Um, essentially, it's uh, called the Space Launch System, and they. I don't know what day they did it on. I think it, the articles I was reading, I think it was yesterday even, at yesterday evening maybe. But essentially, the SLS, uh, they fired the first, what's called a hot fire of the first core stage. And though that's cool, something went wrong. And I don't think they're sure yet. But there was a, it was supposed to go the burn for eight minutes. And the engines started shut down after about a minute a little over a minute so seems like they had what i think it's a four engine burner and it seems like the other thing shut down normally and they're talking about the component failure which might not sound like a big deal but this is the rocket system that's supposed to get you know america or back to the moon before 2020 back to the which i'm all in favor i want to go back to the moon i think it's cool right but it sounds like, given what's going, what happened, who it could push the launch back to who knows when if they can't figure out what went wrong. It also sounds like Boeing and NASA it didn't burn for as long as they expected it to, obviously. And it sounds like they didn't it didn't even burn long enough for them to get the data that all their engineers needed. So I don't know if it'll delay the you know the actual launch or whenever you know, NASA heads back to the moon, but. Both cool and a little, uh, little discouraging. So I'm sure you know the brilliant minds at Boeing and NASA will figure out what's going on, and with luck, you know, it won't push back to launch. So uh, not that it's soon anyway. But I guess in terms of space travel, the future of space travel, four years, less than four, years, isn't really a lot of time, frankly, to develop technology for space travel. So who knows? We'll see. Um, Maybe they should give uh, SpaceX a call, you know? <laughs> they seem to be doing pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> I know NASA and uh, SpaceX worked together before anyway to launch satellites and so on. So, yeah, pretty cool. I hope they figure it out. But uh, much like the, was it the Falcon Heavy or no, the Starship Starship 7, I think, or Starship 8 that launched and then almost landed except for that fiery crash and fireball from SpaceX, um, you know? Space travel is riddled with issues, so we'll get it figured out, I'm sure. But yeah, so cool. Well, any comment? <laughs> no, I, I, you're much more into the the space exploration and space essentially than yeah. uh, than I am. So I, it, it's always an interesting thing for me to learn as we as we do the podcast yeah. and a little bit more about it. But um, no, it's it's definitely I, interesting. Totally every time too, like you wouldn't think that you know a twenty. 2024 sounds like a, and frankly, I too, like you wouldn't think that 2024 sounds like, you know, almost here and that, you know, 2020 felt like an eternity, you know, but it sounds like in, in the world of space exploration, there, who knows if this will push the launch back. And I don't know. I mean, I, I like, I, I, I'd like to definitely see us get back to the moon within my lifetime. I'm not saying it would take that long, but who knows, man? I, uh, We'll see what happens. I'm sure we'll as, as we'll learn more. Get just like the, you know, the FCA merger <clears throat> with with Peugeot, if they choose to release more. Frankly, I don't think that they are required by law to release stuff. It's probably you know, their own intellectual property among connected with Boeing and blah blah blah. So, hopefully, you know, we'll get to learn more about what's what happened there. But I wonder right. how many millions of dollars went into that. Uh, we we're probably huh? looking at we're probably looking at bees, not M's. Oh, yeah, I mean, 
I don't know. Billions I, for. for I, think I think I have nothing. You know, drastically wrong. Nothing blew up. I don't. Nothing blew up. I don't think anybody was hurt. What I'm reading. So, I mean, if the worst that happens is mechanical failures and and technology blows up. I'd rather have that happen than someone get hurt. So, there yeah. is some some good news out of it. They got a minute. Hey, they got a minute. One eighth of the burn time. <laughs> I'm just gonna work on the ba- other seven. <laughs> baby steps? Question mark. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, speaking. Okay, th- I'm sorry about the transitions this week. Speaking of another star. <laughs> oh man, that feels good. <laughs> With Sir Lewis Hamilton watch. Oh my gosh, Sir Lewis uh, Hamilton watch. Uh, we don't really have. We're gonna try to keep this segment going, but it sounds. I think maybe I'll take the lead on this one if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Here. Every, I've been reading over, we, as viewers or viewers and listeners know, we covered, uh, uh, you know, the first Sir Hamilton watch last week, and not a whole lot more to report this week except for maybe more detailed contract information. So he, as of when I last checked today, he's still a free agent, has not signed a contract with uh, Mercedes, and the Mercedes leadership are still unhappy with him for various reasons. It sound like they you know, when push comes to shove, are going to give him the boot. So, and it's interesting because Hamilton, as is, is Nick and you and I both know, there's 20 spots on the F1 grid a year. As of right now, 19 of them have been filled. I'm not talking about like, like if George Russell you know, somehow come up and race for Mercedes, but, you know, right now, nine, the only spot left open for the 2021 season is his, frankly. And if he doesn't fill it, well, the question is, what is what else is he gonna do inside or even outside of? But I got a lead on here on some proposed or some what's the proper term here? Uh, not, not proposed, but uh, reported. It, it's not, it's, not, a, not, but it's essentially what is being uh, was being thought of as his list of demands. It's not confirmed frankly, but it, yeah this is this i think is a speculation of course i don't think we'll know confirmed because this is behind the scenes talks about closed door talks at mercedes but if these are true that, that there's these are the demands from him i <laughs> i don't think mercedes would be very happy about a couple of so here, here's what i was reading so first is again reportedly demands from his hamilton demands sir hamilton was a four-year 200 million dollar salary which equates to essentially fifty million per year. Uh, a limited production AMG one car, as those who might not know, Mercedes AMG is working on a essentially an F one car road. And if you know a little bit about and follow what we talk about with just the sheer forces and just the technological advancements and just how difficult it is to to drive one of those and power and pay for and everything else, that's easier said than done to turn an F one car into car frankly um and he also wants quote a role that goes beyond a drop being a driver and more than a mere testimonial and that kind of makes sense given that we talked about how he's found his voice over the past season while i agree with that one it sounds like that would be kind of hard to pull off frankly because it's a little vague you don't really know what that actually looks like on paper so that seems a little difficult but not definitely doable maybe the four-year $200 million salary sounds like quite a lot of money given the new caps that we've talked about coming down on the sport, frankly, over the next couple of years or a few years. The, 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 the AMG one limited production car sounds like, I mean, come on. He's brought them, what, seven championships, I think? Yeah, right, right Nick? Yep. Mercedes, seven? Yes. I mean, I feel like, yeah, he kind of deserves one of those. Let's be honest. No matter what it costs. Come on, guys. Let's, we can all agree there. Here's the one that I find just astronomical, frankly. Reportedly, he also his fourth demand is ten percent of Mercedes winnings should they win more championships. That's a big deal, frankly, especially to ask for that in what will most likely be years of recovery for the industry from the COVID pandemic. So, I mean, I it makes sense hearing these things that at least for a couple, chiefly the salary and the the winnings percentage, if it's true. I I frankly see the, uh, the the Germans at the helm of it saying, no, we're going to drop you and, and figure it out. I think even Mercedes, after everything that's happened, 
past year is everyone needs money and, and revenue, frankly. So that's a big deal. Um, well, and, I think. and obviously we've seen the running jokes between Hamilton and uh, George Russell where it's, I'm you, but $50 million cheaper or. <laughs> what was that meme that you sent me? Oh, the, the one Ham- earlier was, uh, was the Hamilton's list of uh, supposed demands and uh, George Russell's was uh, all I need is more leg room and a computer with PowerPoint. <laughs> I don't know. I uh, If you asked me last week, do I, th- I think I even I said this, I, I still predict that Hamilton will be racing for Mercedes um, this year, at least one more year. If any of these contract demands now this are, are to be believed, I don't know, frankly. It seems maybe like like the AMG One car, fine. You know, the role that he wants, that makes sense. Uh, the salary, and maybe they could back him down given the, the budget caps, but that 10% of, of Mercedes winnings, if they win more championships, that's, <laughs> I feel like that's kind of a hard... Uh, Hard, hard thing to, to that's negotiate. That's an extremely it's, large percentage. That's yeah, it's big. And uh, and when we're talking the kind of money we're talking, that is a incredible percentage. I don't even know how much money that would be, but I I think the the estimated estimations, if these were to be believed, and if he gets them, frankly, um, depending on how many more wins or the amount of winnings he would get. It could move Hamilton to potentially like the the eleventh or tenth highest paid athlete in the, or twenty like twenty 2020 twenty or twenty twenty one. I mean yeah. that's. I'm not saying he's not worth it, but at the same time, I just find it hard to believe that. I I don't know, man. I I I just I, I feel like he could make that money up in brand deals alone. Yeah, and I I don't know. I, I mean, after all, I don't know what behind the scenes of Mercedes, Beth One and and you know, company and parent everything in Germany, but those seem like some pretty steep demands for them to say yes for, so I'm not sure we do. But I'm not sure if we're gonna see Hamilton race Mr. Sir Hamilton, that is racing on the grid in twenty twenty. Uh, which would uh which would kind of shock. put an end to uh Sir Lewis Hamilton watch, which means I put yeah. together that uh, graphic and soundbite for almost nothing, but that's okay. <laughs> well, because... maybe we can maybe we can turn it into George the Watch if if they are um, <laughs> hiring him. So yeah, uh... we'll, we'll figure something out about it. But uh, one thing that is not going away is our paddock chat. Yeah. So... And with that, we start this week with a bunch of other F one updates. So do you want to hit us off here with some of the updates, my good? Yeah. So uh, Charles Leclerc has COVID nineteen. Uh, we hope which, he recovers quickly and I, I, uh, wish him all the best. Yes, uh, I will repeat the same sentiment. Uh, I do hope that he gets better. I hope he recovers quickly. Also, when you were advised, you know, what did you expect when you were advised by multiple doctors not to travel the world and then you go travel the world, uh, leaving your multi-million dollar house that, uh, you know, nobody would ever really need to leave? But you know, that's, that's fine. It's, oh, it's, it's tell me like, how you really feel. Yeah, it's not like we're bitter or anything. It's fine. Maybe on uh, I, hey, don't I, mean, I didn't say anything. <laughs> Maybe move on a little bit happier note. Then uh, Kevin Magnuson and and uh, he and his wife, I believe, welcomed the new baby. I don't know the gender. I know as I saw it on Instagram. So congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. Very sincere congratulations to the Magnuson family. That's especially in you know, current times. I mean. I think it was it was a couple of days. It was definitely over the past week. I hope it was at least that's when they came across on Instagram. But yeah, I mean, what, what a way to start off the new year with a new baby. Frankly, that's pretty. Um, congratulations to them, man. Um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think another one is uh, totally unrelated. Is we're we're seeing McLaren. Maybe maybe some quick news here. McLaren that previously raced, I believe, years ago with Honda power units with the the team McLaren. Um, and then I think most recently raced with Renault power units. They are now transitioning to Mercedes driven power units. I don't know if that's specifically for 2020 or if that's for 2021 and beyond, but no matter when it takes shape, uh, it sounds like it could be a better match given arrow arrow updates and upgrades for their next car or cars, the plural. 
And it sounds like, based on the, the leaders of the respective heads within McLaren, that things are going according to plan on, on schedule. So, again, don't know what that means, but we could see, we will see, hopefully, McLaren's powered Mercedes near not to in the non-traditional future so 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 what that gives us the silver mercedes the white mercedes uh, and the orange a, a, mercedes the orange mercedes well and... we don't know we don't know what, what the liveries are going to be for the next year so who knows <laughs> well and whose motors are aston martin running this year i don't know uh, frankly well would, i forgot to ch- i forgot to check into that i don't know because uh, if we'll, we'll check in on that uh for uh maybe some f1 I'll, I don't know. Why don't you go ahead and, and, and touch on Cyril and his Renault, yeah, uh, so Renault another, departure? You find that out I'll if you can. Out. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, another big new thing in F1, uh, you know, chatting here over the past week is uh, I'm just going to call him Cyril because I can't pronounce his last name. Former team principal at Renault is gone. Um, it, that's kind of a big shock because those who are F1 fans, the team principal Christian Horner at uh, Red Bull. Uh, they like to argue a lot. So the question, the big question on my mind, and everybody is, who is Christian going to argue with now? <laughs> now that he's gone. But all, all joking said aside, it sounds like when Renault joined back F1 back in, which is currently for the new, you know, they were Renault end of ending last year. They will be Alpine it's this year. And one moving forward. Renault, when they joined F1 in 2016, I think they had some lofty I think within three seasons, which would have been 2018, 2019-ish, they wanted to be on the podium, have a podium finish. And within five seasons, which I think 2020, when they joined technically, they wanted to be um, in the running for the Constructors' Championship. Arguably, though, that their goals kind of were frankly realized. And it sounds like, you know, with the redesign and restructure rebranding whatever to alpine it seems like the company the the organization wants a fresh start uh so thank you to cyril for his years of dedication to f1 Renault for some fantastic races over the years but it sounds like you know a lot of teams frankly with changes in management or drivers or rebranding are going into brand new uh fresh start Renault is not, you know, is now one of them. So that's kind of some big news of, about him over the past week. I was a little shocked when I heard it. I did not expect it to be totally honest, so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And I and I did, um, no, one, Cyril has made some very significant com, uh, contributions to F1. So it will be, it will be extremely different sad. especially with it will be sad and it'll also be extremely different to see how i mean obviously you know we, we've we got brand names changing and everything is going back and leadership forth but changing i mean I leadership pre- changing but I, but I did say i'm not expecting anything new to happen you know in in this season of f1 based on just the off-season mix-ups i think i and i hope i am gonna be proven <laughs> will will I, the cars be significantly different? I don't think so. Will no. the teams be significantly different? Absolutely. And the results, right. Frankly. I I think I hope I'll be proven wrong. I think I am wrong. Of course, it's for to be proven. So any news on Aston Martin's power units? Yes. So they will be green Mercedes. Oh, so there's going to be a lot. So what? Mercedes is just. I don't get this. Mercedes is just handing engines and give one. Yeah, so essentially, well, because they were racing point, I don't yeah. think I, Aston Martin has said that by 2022 they will more than likely become an engine manufacturer as well. I that wouldn't surprise me. I mean, come on, it surprise me, frankly. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, I think back. I think before Honda, Red Bull was powered by uh, Tag Heuer built Aston Martin power units, weren't? Essentially, I have that wrong. yeah, no. It, it, essentially, yes. It was an Aston Martin block that was tuned or gone over by Tag. There was a very, it was a very, very interesting, weird. yeah. It was a very interesting but way it, of it going through it. Really, I mean, they Red Bull's been number two right behind Mercedes for for a very long 
for very, at least time. a very long time. So lots of Mercedes, different Mercedes cars, uh, teams out there just come in here. So I think uh, the last thing is we, we touched on a little bit is in F1 news is uh, Russell, um, George Russell. So I, I read an article that I found interesting. We might not have seen him race in the Secure Grand Prix, I believe, is when he raced and, and showed that he is a fantastic driver. And was Hamilton's seat when he was diagnosed and covering from COVID. Um, he uh, sounds like that he had the, the uh, what leadership, I think, of Williams. Th- I mean, and throughout the year, uh, well, I don't know when... I don't know when the, the Williams family essentially sold the Williams F1 team. I think it was sometime during the mid-2020 season. But it sounds like under their old leadership, he, there was no way he was going to race for Mercedes, despite being a, a Mercedes junior and, and in their development program, not even filling in as a reserve driver. They were very strict on not letting him essentially race for anything Mercedes. And, ha- and I find that kind of interesting because I asked a question – what if they had had stayed, you know, the owners and the leaders of of the and managers of the team? We wouldn't have seen, I think, Russell and his talents this past season, and therefore, I don't think he'd be in the spot he is now. With uh, frankly, a lot of the world behind him wanting to see him step into a larger role, I find that a little interesting. Um, frankly, that sounds like Williams wanted to keep him himself, but yet, I'd argue, aren't even at least last year, up through last year, who knows for the new, right? Aren't giving him a car really of his own talent. So, well, interesting. Yes. And, and it's not that Williams doesn't have the pedigree. I mean, obviously Williams has been oh, a world they've won championship team. And, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm saying currently, I mean, let's well, right. honest, they I, haven't had the car current. No, they, they haven't had the car, but they know that they have the driver. I mean, look at it. It, it would take, as much as people I mean, want to say, well, it's the car, it's the car, it's the car. It's when you put, car. it's not. And we saw that last year when he filled in for for Lewis. Uh-huh. You know. And he, he had his shot. And because he of, he, he performed perfectly until Mercedes screwed him over. I find that interesting. I mean, <laughs> we'll go into that again. I think... Uh, it is interesting, and I guess and from one sense, it makes sense to kind of lock him down, but, I mean, it sounds like he just at least used to be caught in, like, like just a hole where he, he wanted so much more, what he was, frankly, letting him, and it makes me even slightly even happier that he then got a chance, and he didn't, clearly didn't even, he didn't squander it. Like, I didn't expect he would anyway, but he, it was almost like if I'm Russell starting a 2020 season, no chance, you know, whatever. I'm still kind of pigeonholed into where I am now. And all of a sudden, through the way the season shaped up and, and moves that were made around, he gets, like, the chance he might have been, you know, begging for. I'm not saying he was, but you know what I mean. And he didn't disappoint, and that's... Well, look at it this way. If Hamilton, part of the whole Hamilton contract stuff that I've been reading about, at the end of every article, it's you know, like, well, you know, if he doesn't get signed, maybe Russell will be brought up. I mean, that wouldn't have happened, frankly. A lot of other things didn't happen last year. So I thought that was interesting. I didn't know anything behind the scenes kind of stuff like that, but I think I think it was confirmed by Russell himself. So it's uh, interesting. And, you know, while he's committed to Williams uh, for the current season, upcoming season, with uh, Sir Hamilton watch and uh, contract, I think we until you know first yeah, uh, starting grid on that first first race. So yeah. absolutely. So um, let's see. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, we'll continue to keep an eye on it. We'll continue to keep an eye on other racing series. We're pretty much in the off season right now, as most racing series take place in the northern hemisphere, and it's currently winter. Um, A little cold. Yeah, although I did see Valtteri was out uh, doing some rally, rally, <laughs> rally through the snow, which looked what a cool like guy. a yeah, <laughs> what a cool looked guy. like a lot of fun. Well, I think I want to move in that maybe a little bit more. Uh, I th- I think something that you and I are chatting about here will have 
I think the same opinions on, but something that definitely has come across my feed recently. I don't in the U S here, California, uh, banned, uh, at a future date. I don't know. I think like 20, 2025, 2035, something like that. Maybe internal combustion engines, ICE, um, you know, with the ever increasing push towards green energy and the environmental impact from the automotive industry, frankly, worldwide and, you know, push towards electric cars, frankly, and, and getting rid of emissions issue, you know, issues. And I think that brings up, I think another state recently did it, which is why it came up in my, my news feed. I don't know who or frankly how it came up, but it got me thinking, is that a good idea? Just in general is, you know, banning internal combustion engines at a future date, a good idea. And my quick opinion is, unless some other criteria are met, no. If you look at history, other countries and even other states like California have tried to ban, I think, internal combustion engines for favor of green policies and green solutions into the future. But at best, they don't generally work out very well because oftentimes when these bans are instituted and in, at a future date, the technology isn't there yet, even horizon to kind of make up for that ban good example is well we've talked about it before the economies economies of scale and the affordability and cost effectiveness of internal combustion engines compared to evs right now we're getting there right but we're not there yet to where battery tech and electric vehicles can be had built you know paid for by the public for the same prices as as i see frankly and so let me let me provide counterpoint to this. Okay. I'm with you on the overall. Counterpoint, putting a date on it is going to force companies to manufacture and develop better electric or alternative energy vehicles. Uh-huh. Wouldn't it? Uh see I was that, that was my last counterpoint is on one hand, I think that is true. It could be a swift kick in the butt for companies to innovate even quicker. But I'll contrary, I'll, I'll you know, speak to the other side of that and the contrary. Even despite the push, I would argue that, you know, the market kind of di- number one, the market dictates what it wants, right? And if the market doesn't want EVs and still want ICEs, well then that ban is not going to be effective at all. Number two is with technology, every not everything's like you know computer chips and computer parts, where we we just get so much technological advance so quickly. Frankly, um, I don't know, I can't cite an example, but I have to imagine everything doesn't just you know increase and get technologically better on an on an exponential scale overnight kind of thing. So no matter how quick they push, the tech or materials or processes or, or that just might not be there yet. Frankly, and what we hope will take five years might take 35 frankly and the other part of that is i I, i'm more more so that is true i agree i more so see the bands as a superficial thing to appease constituents frankly um when you ban something and say like you know evs i don't think for a while even will be as cost effective as internal combustion engine automobiles again the power and charging infrastructure that we have ICEs compared to EVs right now. You, when you ban something, if you don't have the, the replacement kind of ready to go, or at least very quickly, then your ban's not going to work either, frankly. So at best, well, is it that... just, a, it's just a stunt move to say, we're going to ban them by this you know, in, in 10 years from now. But can you actually do that, frankly? Are, you, are we in a position to be able to do that? Well, so. until I have, you know, essentially until I have an EV, and we've talked about this in the past, but until I have an EV that can keep up with my daily travel schedule for work. Yeah, I've said the same thing. If, if it can have the same range, uh, same infrastructure support that we currently well, enjoy, and, and my, it can and my, same my use, concern, yeah. yeah, my concern is I can spend 15 minutes at a gas station. Uh-huh. petrol station if you're overseas 
I can spend 15 minutes at a gas station refueling and continue and you know and 10 of that is, is walking through is walking through the store looking for snacks <laughs> uh, essentially yeah i mean i've got a big tank on my durango but that's <laughs> not you know well i mean that's the other thing is like people i think so often don't talk i mean yeah the infrastructure and like when you need more electricity you need the power grid and the generation like ability to create that to supply that increased electricity need well yeah. but then on top of that how do you i mean unless i can charge a car in the same time it takes me to charge you know yeah fill i haven't touched on that like, let's be honest that's a big deal too but also isn't really talked about um and one can say then you got to plan your trips a different way and battery tech will get better over time i agree to that point the other thing i would say is you know instead of banning i i agree with with the push i i, I agree with the sentiment behind it to accelerate development and you know, curb emissions and, and all. I, I agree I'm fully, fully behind that. I think what's what's shown over time to be more effective instead of outright bans by X year in the future is a increasingly stricter and better emission standards to where kind of like, like a slow, gradual, you know, slope to get to that point over time with emission standards or green production methods and that kind of thing than just an all-out ban. I think... And that also gives them more time for that development to then have that replacement ready when the end here comes for internal combustion engine production in various states. I think that's been proven over time, but even here in the states with a couple of clean or green energy acts. So, I mean, I'm not saying that it's wrong to move in the direction. What I'm personally saying is I don't agree with, with banning internal combustion engines outright in favor of, you know, more stepped procedures to kind of get us to that point than kind of a, you know, cold turkey approach, you know, quitting cold turkey. Yeah. No matter how far into the future. I mean, and I could be wrong. Again, that'll be proven wrong. Maybe battery tech is something and EVs is something that we'll see it, no matter the infrastructure and power and everything else is something we'll see grow in terms of technological advancements on a exponential scale like computers back in the 90s i mean we just don't know yet and it seems like bands nowadays are more so just poor stunts at this point i'd, I'd like to see that in the future they become not but i can only speak in current terms right and that's my pers that's my opinion on the matter but yeah and, and again i think i share a lot of the same thoughts and the same background here i think I, I guess the only thing that I would say differently is we've tried to do this in the past with a stepped plan or a tiered plan to try and move forward more and more. We just have never followed through on the punishments behind it. Uh -huh. And yep. I think at this point, I think a lot of people are getting to the point where they're fed up with not having that moving you know that that ability to move forward so they've jumped to extreme conclusions yeah i mean it's sometimes progressive measures do yield results um frankly i, I will admit that as well i think it would be interesting to see obviously and, and, it's and a, a lot it's of these states sense, are not but... outright banning internal combustion engines they're just banning the sale of new internal combustion yeah. engines yeah, like that's not. I guess we probably should equip. It's not like if you have one, you can't drive it. I, I would say you know you can't keep it probably within reason to it passing even stricter at that point emission standards. Frankly, to be honest, but you know it's the the the, the sale of, of new like moving forward kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so in yeah. if we're gonna do that, emission standards need to be a lot higher than they are now. Uh, at least in our yeah. home state of Illinois, because. There was absolutely no reason why our 98 Ram with a whole, like six holes in the exhaust and a burning head gasket was able to pass emissions. <laughs> but you know what? We got it stickered. So and I, we literally just drove it in, crossed our fingers, cleared the check engine light 15 minutes beforehand, and it cleared. And it went right through. I mean... If we're gonna, uh, if we're really gonna be strict about emission standards, let's be strict about it. Yeah. So maybe that's maybe that's not not to get political. Definitely seems open to 
individuals, at least here in the U.S., individual states' discretion. So, I mean, again, with anything, even more so with this topic, I think time will tell. Uh, we, we just don't, we don't know what we don't know yet, frankly, you know? Well, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of interesting things happening with, you know, electric power, you know, EVs and whatever. Maybe along a similar or parallel line, we move to some interesting developments in the auto manu- auto manufacturing sector with, uh, as in regards to semiconductor microchips. Um, would you like to talk about this one, or, or should I uh, should I should I move forward on this one? Well, no, it's um, so essentially a lot of these the well almost every major manufacturer right now that is facing serious concerns about the ability to produce uh, microprocessors. Obviously every car nowadays yeah with especially with being computer controlled frankly. right mm-hmm. yeah essentially everything having an in dash entertainment system and it, it, these entertainment systems getting larger and larger and they have more and more connected information oh, yeah, on I, them. I didn't think about that it's not just you know entertainment systems and like in new touch screens and it's it's legitimate car functions and well right you know, yeah I, control I, was, units. I was getting to that okay. point but yes you know in addition to all of those additional things, you're getting more and more data out of the car. And if you're getting more and more data out of the car, you need more and more technological uh, connection to the vehicle mm-hmm. uh, down to where you can start looking at the health of your engine in live time. Yeah. It and sounds that, like that's becoming an issue for, for companies where, you know, they can't, they can't source uh, maybe, maybe more so in the U S but, uh, they can't source chips anymore, frankly. And with the pandemic, we saw, you know, obviously car sales decline. You know, I mean, that's a little bit obvious. But at the same time, now that, that things are kind of ramping back up and a little bit of recovery and things will get back to the new normal. The problem now is I think we car manufacturers can't source enough semiconductor m- microchips, essentially, that they need for their their production lines for everything inside that Nick was going right, and to make it even worse, because the reason why is because during the pandemic, and I think still more so, the companies that create and supply those semiconductor semiconductors shifted more so to consumer electronics products um, because of you know gaming and people staying home and not driving cars and not buying new cars. Right now. Not even that, but the U.S. government has even, you know, companies like Ford over the last week that just, uh, you know, halted production at their Louisville plant. And I think we, we, we were looking at um, Nissan producing production at some of its plants. Fiat Chrysler is doing the same thing. Um, Toyota is limiting production of the Tundra because of something like this as well. Super, government is also, super shut down their Forester line entirely. Yeah, I mean, and, and specifically the chips, I think the U.S. government is blacklisted uh, already a a backlog of chips from essentially what is China's largest producer of said semiconductors because of their suspected ties to the Chinese military. And that just makes it even worse. So it's interesting. I think it's interesting to see how companies are going to, well, frankly, recover from not only, you know, pandemic and crisis and whatever else, but this as well, like even if they wanted to get back in production, there's so many more hurdles right now to, 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 to jump over, frankly, um, and it makes sense that the producers of these of these semiconductors would shift their focus to consumer electronics more so because you know they follow the market, right? Anybody does, frankly, and I, I don't know how they're going to recover. But uh, that's not to say that they won't. I mean, car companies have we've seen done different things to kind of weather the pandemic and kind of survive. You know, hopefully we'll see them get a little more inventive to come out of it even better as you know hopefully 2021 brings much more recovery for vaccines and economic recovery but uh yeah time will tell too i think right definitely so yeah um, it's it's interesting i think uh, one thing that i hope stays here is like some of the catalog like pivoting to doing like uh what virtual car walkthroughs frankly um you know, kind of some cool things during the pandemic or 
delivering cars to your to your door driveway you know so you don't have to go and pick it up and kind of thing um you know car i, I I'm, I'm sick as i'm saying it. i think that they will recover it's a question of how and when i think that you know the, the giants of you know ford and fiat chrysler and toyota nissan subaru whatever they'll recover they'll figure it out they would they've weathered the storm right now i think we'll see oh we'll see them continue to do what they also did the pandemic where they shifted limited production to more lucrative models they, they push their marketing and they push their manufacture of car um what's the word like um models well yeah car models frankly that were had more of a profit margin than say others for example i can't sense that you sell money on than other also help you know get some more revenue and weather the storm so i think we'll see them continually evolve but much like anybody the the, the war is not over yet for semiconductors or any other thing caused by the pandemic frankly for multiple industries so. right yeah yeah do you want to do our last thing i think uh, maybe on some end on some good news i think uh something kind of a new you found a new development new thing to that's kind of cool frankly uh you want learn us a few things about the new uh new, a new drone yeah so so when a lot of people hear drone they get a little hesitant uh especially when i it's specifically a military drone which i understand Skynet. <laughs> well or you know if, it, for our international viewers i know everybody has a bad uh. taste in their mouth about Americans and, and our military drones. However, this one is not uh, designed we to be. We won't go a, into that here. <laughs> this one's not designed to be a uh, a uh, deadly machine. This one is specifically wow. designed to uh, a- assist our deadly military, machines. foreign mili- militaries, and other machines to <laughs> stay in the air longer. So this is. Uh, what we're talking about is Boeing's MQ-25 refueling drone. And essentially what this drone is, it, it's a mobile, much smaller refueling station uh, that it can be launched from an aircraft carrier. So essentially providing a higher... That's a big deal, frankly. I mean, Very big no deal. And, and current, what I know about current air-to-air refueling techs, essentially large tanker aircraft aircraft with those large tanks that just fly throughout areas within the world and you know you you see like i like on military movies and big boom arms and we were talking about what the sr-71 refuel yep. for like an like nafta burner like that's current tech right and you can't launch those from aircraft carriers of course they also have a limited range and because they're aircraft themselves so this could be a potentially a big deal for you know our military and our allies as I imagine like you said right right more mobile refueling station frankly right and one launchable from an aircraft carrier which means you can get it a lot closer to the battlefield and essentially um get it a lot closer to where you need refueling and the other guy the you know the fight the other people could be a huge tactical advantage right exactly you know, Without you having to return to, to base, you'll be able to side out of the fight. Exactly. While that's, someone that's needs cool. to go refuel, you'd be able to refuel mid-air from essentially anywhere you've got a jet currently. And you can maintain air superior uh, air superiority. Correct. Not, you know, you know, so which I, I would I would imagine that is there any ETA on like you know when this is deployable for our military. U.S. military and ally. I haven't military. seen an official date yet, but I know that it is going through its, f- again, it's a drone, so it doesn't have the strict yeah. um, or as strict of a guidance uh, and, and stipulations that it needs to jump through and certifications that it needs to fly. Uh-huh. It has completed multiple test flights. It has completed multiple carrier launches and landings. So at this point, oh, that's difficult. E- extremely difficult, especially for something that's not AI. It, it is controlled remotely, um, uh-huh. 
but I mean, this is this is a pretty big deal. So and it's further taking, you know, it's technological advancement, and I think we'll see with Terry that you know that that's the future of of battle. Quote, hope less of it in the future, uh, but you know, it's in the mat. Nonetheless, it's taking you know, hopefully more and more of our, our service men and women out of, you know, not having to, you know, fly or refuel and, uh, you know, have the chance of being uh, put in danger because of it, maybe, frankly. So, you know, it, it is the way of the future. And, but again, I hope I'm proving that stuff like this or EVs, you know, we see many more technological advancements even quicker, frankly. Yeah. That's cool. I yeah. mean, uh well, I think what we'll, we'll, I think since this is more you know with Boeing as well with, with your uh, your your background and, and knowledge about Boeing, I guess if if we see anything more, you'll uh, you know you'll catch it hopefully and see if you know any developments come from the new uh, the new drone the new refueling drone. Right? Yep. All right. Well, I think uh, with that, that brings us to the checkered flag for this week. We hope you guys enjoyed the new again layout. For our, our video audience on YouTube. Uh, if you guys have any feedback, for again, please reach out to us at uh, podcast at redlineresorts.com or uh, get in touch with us on social media where on all platforms, our handle is at Redline Resorts. With that, until next week, I'm Matt, that's Nick, and thanks for tuning into the show. Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys.